Good morning. How is everybody doing this morning? Good. Okay. Is everybody stuffed because of Thanksgiving? Does anyone have any leftovers that they haven't eaten yet? Uh, normally. How about pie? What kinds of pie have you guys had this past week? What kinds of pie do we have? Brown. Pecan? Brown. Brown pie? Okay. What what other kinds? What? I heard soup. Silk. Oh, French silk. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, I had some rhubarb pie, and that was pretty good. Rhubarb is really good. Um, well, I wanted to thank you all for being here this morning, um, and uh, I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving this past week. I know I did. I had the pleasure of coming home for this week and spending time with my family and being able to see my brother, um, which was really nice. Um, But also, um, I'm going back today, going back to college today. I'm going to college at Ozark Christian College. Um, uh, I'm getting my degree in theology and Christian formation. Um, And I just wanted to give a thanks to you guys and share my gratitude with you guys because over the years, you guys have been a real encouragement to me um, and have supported me, whether that's financially or whether that's just through hugs and uh, welcomes when I come back on the weekends. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, today, we're going to be talking about contentment. And contentment is, contentment is a little similar to Thanksgiving. Sometimes it seems a little foreign to Thanksgiving because on one day, you know, we're thankful for what we have and then on the next we're playing to buy that next new thing um, on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Not all of us, but some of us. But, you know, I I bought something, so that's, um, I'm just going to throw that out there. But contentment can seem foreign to Thanksgiving, right? Because contentment is, you know, being satisfied with what we have, but also being satisfied with what we don't have. And there's a person today that we're talking about, Paul, who has firsthand knowledge of what it means to be content in every circumstance. Paul is writing this letter, this letter that we've been going through a series in called Allegiance, and this series that is in the letter of Philippians that we've been going through is, you know... Paul is in chains as he's writing this letter. I mean, he's in prison. Now, we don't know whether he's in prison in Ephesus or he's in Rome, but he is in prison suffering for the sake of the gospel. And yet, Paul is writing about contentment in every circumstance. Uh, Today, if Paul was to, you know, sum up, or if we were to read this passage and we were going to try to sum up contentment in a sentence, I would say that contentment is acknowledging our weaknesses through the acceptance of God's strength. It's acknowledging our weaknesses through the acceptance of God's strength. That's probably what I would define contentment in. But let's go ahead and get into our passage this morning. So if you would, would you turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, um, starting in verse 10. We're not going to have the passages up on the screen this morning, but we, um, it is, there might be Bibles underneath your seats um, for you to use. Um, but this is what Paul writes in verse 10. He says, I have rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. And he's writing this to the church in Philippi. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. But Paul says, I have rejoiced greatly in the Lord. But we know Paul's circumstances here. I mean, he doesn't have a ton to rejoice about, right? I mean, he's, you know, been called as this instrument to the Gentiles and to share the gospel, and he's been put in prison for it. I mean, he's writing this in chains. And so we wonder, well, what does Paul really have to rejoice about? Well, if you remember from last week's sermon about Epaphroditus, and and my dad taught about Epaphroditus and how Epaphroditus came from this church in Philippi over to Paul to help Paul in and aid Paul in prison, and how Epaphroditus almost got died because he was sick, and yet 
the Lord spared Epaphroditus. And not only that, but the Lord also spared Paul from having to sorrow over his brother's death. Brother in Christ, not actual brother, but his brother's death, if you are following. Um, So Epaphroditus was able to help Paul when he was in prison. Not that he was in need, but this was a generosity of the church out of their own heart, out of their own contentment, out of the own blessings that they had been given from the Lord. And Paul writes about this more in verse 14, if you continue on. He says, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desired your gifts. What I desired is that more be credited to your accounts. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And so we ask ourselves, well, what does Paul have to rejoice about? He actually has quite a lot. This little church, this church in Philippi, has been aiding Paul in his ministry from the very first day. And in Thessalonica, they've aided him more than once, we find out. And Paul is saying, hey, you guys are storing up treasure in heaven. More needs to be credited to you on your account because of what you're doing for the kingdom. And so we see this generosity within the church. And which makes Paul joyful throughout this book, throughout this letter. I mean, joy and rejoice all right, are mentioned a lot in the letter to the Philippians, okay? They, it's mentioned 16 times, like the words joy and rejoice. 16 times in a four-chapter letter. I mean, that's a lot of joy. And even in his circumstances, Paul is able to be thankful for, be able to be content with what he's been given. And he's even given more from this church in Philippi. Now, we have a question to ask ourselves. Is what does contentment, we're going to ask ourselves three questions this morning, but what does contentment look like outwardly? Like if you were to look at someone and and see that they were a content person, how would you know? Well, I think you would know if they were a generous person. Like, generosity is the outward workings of contentment. And we see this church in Philippi being very generous. I mean, if you go to verse 19, it says, And my God, Paul's God, will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Because the Lord is meeting their needs, they are able to meet the needs of others. And so we have this opportunity to be generous. And even though, you know, we may not experience the type of persecution that Paul experienced, or we may not, you know, have the type of persecution that the early church or Christians throughout history or all over the globe are experiencing and enduring for the gospel, I mean, we still experience different sorts of persecutions here in this country, although they may not be physical as much. We still have the responsibility to share the gospel to others, to share the gospel to the lost, but then also to be generous with those who are doing the same, to be generous with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to be generous with those in this country who are doing that, but then in other countries as well. Maybe there's a mission. Maybe there's people that you know personally who are in another country who are doing the work of Christ Jesus and sharing to the lost peoples and lost nations across the world. And so we have a responsibility to give generously, just as the church in Philippi did. Now, if you continue on, Paul has more to say on the topic of contentment. In verse 12, he says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul knows how to be content in every situation. Now, 
If you go back with me for a second, and let's take a larger lens, let's take a 30,000-foot view of Paul's life, he wasn't always known by the name Paul. He was known by the name Saul at one point, right? Before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he, you know, was this Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, he was rigorous about the law. This is what he says about himself in Galatians. He says, this is Paul speaking, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. I mean, Saul, this guy before Jesus, was a Pharisee who was surpassing every one of his peers, like, you go look at him, you look at him, he's like, no, you go to Saul, and Saul knows his law better than everyone else does. And according to the law, now catch this, according to the law, he was a righteous person. And he, that if you go according to what Jesus says, and if you go according to the gospel, then he was a sinner like the rest of us. And he was killing Christians and persecuting Christians. But Saul had everything he wanted. He had the authority and the credibility of this religious leader in this group. I mean, he was there at the stoning of Stephen, and he approved. I mean, he had some respect as this religious leader. But so that's a moment, perhaps, that he had everything. But then there's moments in his life when he's Paul when he hasn't had that kind of credibility. If, if you track with me, you know, Saul turns or, or transforms or experiences this inner transformation of the heart. I mean, he's on this road to Damascus and he doesn't expect this, but Jesus shows up out of nowhere, surprises him, and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and Saul becomes blind and he goes to find Ananias. Ananias is told about this man, Saul, and Ananias heals him. He becomes a Christian. He receives the Holy Spirit and he's going and preaching in Damascus. And the people in Damascus, they want to kill him because they don't know what's happened to this guy. And so they plan to kill him. He escapes the city. He goes to the disciples. And the disciples are afraid of him because they know this guy by the name Saul. And there's like, this guy's the person who was putting Christians in prison. This guy's the person who's been killing Christians. I don't think we can trust him. So they couldn't trust him. And so there's this moment in Paul's life when he doesn't have the credibility. He doesn't have this authority that he does in some of these letters. Like, he hasn't set that up yet. He hasn't, even, even though he's experienced Jesus, and the disciples don't know him like that. But we see and hear and, and read about this in Acts, that Barnabas comes up and puts his hand basically around Paul and takes him to the disciples and says, hey, I know you guys don't trust them, but this, this isn't Saul anymore. This is Paul. This is the guy who's experienced transformation. He's changed. He was on the road to Damascus. This, this happened. There was an event that happened in his life. Like, he's not the same man. And so now, Paul is able to be trusted with the disciples because he needed help. He needed Barnabas. He needed someone to vouch for him on his behalf because he did not have the credibility. And so there's been moments in his life where he's had the credibility, and there's been moments in his life where he just doesn't have anything. And so we see that Paul knows what it's like to have or, or to be in need, and he knows what it's like to have plenty. But if we continue, um, or if we think about contentment, and we think about what he says. He says, whether well-fed or whether hungry, you know, whether he has nothing or whether he has everything, he's content. But isn't contentment, being satisfied, being fulfilled, like, isn't hunger go against that? Like, if you're hungry for something, you know, isn't it easier to be content when you have a full stomach than when you have an empty stomach? Like, I feel like it's a lot easier to be content if you have everything you need than when you are in need. But no, contentment doesn't have to do with whether you're satisfied or not. Contentment doesn't have to do with that. In every circumstance, you can be content because it's not about the circumstance as it is about um, the strength of the Lord. Um, but we'll learn about that. But to 
for us in our culture, we, we tend to be dissatisfied, discontented in the now. We tend to be striving after the later, and we're never able to really be content in the now or satisfied with the now because we're always, always going. We're going, going, going. I'm running out of time. I'm spending, I, I don't have any more time. I'm spending my time wise or not wisely. And so we have these like phrases that surround time because time is such a precious commodity to us, and yet we're never able to really be content with the time we already have. We're never able to be content at where we are right now. To demonstrate that, though, I have this story that I wanted to share with you guys this morning. Um, there's these two pilots. They're best friends. They've known each other for years. And they're, you know, one of them's the co-pilot, one of them's the pilot, and they decide to go on this trip over these Appalachian Mountains. And so they're flying over these Appalachian Mountains in the plane, and the co-pilot looks up to the pilot, and he sees that the pilot is looking down. But as he's looking down, he's tipping down the steering wheel. And so they start going down, and he finally the pilot catches himself before he gets too low and doesn't crash. Everything's okay. But the co-pilot's <laughs> a little worried about this because he's like, what, what in the world are you doing, man? And so they finally get to the destination, and the co-pilot goes up to him, of course, and walks up to him. He's like, hey, what was that back there? What were you doing? Why did you almost run into this mountain? And well, the pilot just kind of smiles and laughs a little. He's like, sorry about that. But uh, that was that valley that we were in, you know, the one with the stream in it. That was where me and my father, we would go on vacation to go swim, or not go swimming, but to go fishing in that river, and we would try to catch as many trout as we could, and as we were trying to catch this fish, airplanes would fly over, and I would look up, and I'd see the airplane, and I'd say to my father, you know, one of these days, I'm going to be up there in the air, I'm going to be flying, flying above all these mountains, flying above these trees, I'm going to be a pilot, and that's what I wanted to do the most, like in all the world, that's what I wanted to be, is a pilot, and well, now the co-pilot's a little you know, more settled, a little less frustrated with his friend, but he's a little more curious, though, because he's wondering. He's like, okay, well, and asks him, what do, you, what do you want now? Like, now that you're a pilot, what do you want now? And the pilot, he doesn't really need to think about it. He kind of knows it in his head already. He doesn't have to debate or think about this because he already knows from his heart. And he says, well, now... I want to go fishing with my father. See, sometimes we get caught in these places in life, and we wish we were somewhere else. We go look at ourselves in the mirror after Thanksgiving, and we're like, well, this really isn't a ton to work with. You know, I, I've gained a few pounds. I'm not really where I want to be, but give it a couple weeks, you know, and maybe, you know, after working out, I'm going to be somewhere else, and we're not able to be content where we are. That's just one example, though, because, you know, we have jobs and positions, and there's probably always a position that's over you that you might want to get to, like a certain rank that you want to level up to. There are always going to be that next destination, and we're never going to get there. I mean, we say we're not there yet, but we're not going to get to there. I don't know where there is for you, but we're not going to make it to where we ever want to be. And so my first question is, is what does contentment look like when on the outside? What are the outwardly workings of contentment? Well, if we are content, then we are generous people just like the church in Philippi, then we are giving to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are serving in the name of the Lord in other countries. Now, and in this country as well, and people you know every day, and helping them just like they did with Epaphroditus and Paul. And my second question, what does it look like when contentment is absent from our lives? Like, if contentment just isn't there, if you look at a person and you realize, though, this person is discontent or I am discontent, what does it look like? Well, it looks like worries, specifically worries about tomorrow. Specifically, I don't know if I'm going to get to this destination tomorrow. And Jesus has a little bit of something to say in Matthew chapter 6, if you'd like to turn there. It's in verse 30, and he says, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, 
which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And then he kind of gives them a blow by saying, O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? And in verse 34 it says, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so if worry is the absence of contentment, why do we worry? Why are we worried? Because we realize we don't have what it takes to make it in this world. We realize that we don't have it, what it takes to get that promotion, or we might not have what it takes to, you know, do whatever we're seeking to do. And so there's lots of worries we have. Are we going to have enough for retirement? Are we going to have enough uh, to provide for our family? And so we are worried about the next day when we are not satisfied with today. And we try to do it on our own, and we get told this, like, you know, have confidence, be bold. Like, if you go to any, like, read any, like, secular, like, leadership book, and it's telling you, you can do this, you know, be confident, it's, it's charisma, it's, it's, you know, and you have all these, like, things that are within yourself that you're apparently supposed to, like, pull out of yourself and bring out of yourself, and a lot of times we just can't find those things because they don't really come from us, and so self-sufficiency is, is a problem for us because we can't be self-sufficient. We can't help ourselves. And if you were listening to the verse earlier, Paul talks about this secret of contentment. He's like, okay, so if we are discontent people, if we worry a lot and we have these worries that we're worried about, how can we be more content? What's the secret to contentment? And Paul knows it, and this is what he writes. He says in the same passage, he says um, in Philippians, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now listen to verse 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So what is this? What, what, what can he do through him who gives me strength? Well, this is be content. Be content in every circumstance. Like this verse has been used in a lot of different contexts. But if you look at the context in this passage, then you realize it's to be content in every circumstance, even in prison, even when we are hungry, even when we don't have what it takes, even when we are in need, even in our weaknesses, because of the strength of the Father, we can be content. And so the first question was, is what does contentment look like on the outside? Generosity. The second question is, what does contentment look like when it is absent from our lives? It looks like a lot of worry, a lot of anxiety. And the third question is, what does it look like to be content in every circumstance? Well, Paul kind of gives us a little bit of a bigger picture. For him, at least, what does it look like for Paul to be content in every circumstance? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about this time when he had this thorn in his side. And this thorn was kind of a struggle for him. I don't know if it was like a physical thorn or something else, but we do know that Paul had this thorn, with metaphorical or not, in his side. And he pleads to the Lord not once, not twice, but three times for the Lord to take it away. And this is what the Lord says to him. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. This is in verse 9 of chapter 12. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. This is Paul speaking. So that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So does the Lord take Paul's thorn away? No, he doesn't take it away. Is he still in need? Does it probably still hurt? Yeah, it's still there. And yet, what the Lord tells him is he says, my grace is sufficient for you. 
My power is made perfect in weakness. And so when Paul is weak, it is then that the power of Christ is able to rest on him. It is then in his weakness that he has the strength of God the most. It is when he acknowledges that he is weak that he can accept the strength of God. It's that acknowledgement that we have to rely on the Savior when we are weak. I mean, this is what Paul said. I mean, he said, whether I die to Christ and go be with Christ, and that's a gain, and whether if I live and live to serve Christ, that is also a gain. So it's kind of a win-win situation. In, I, in death and in life, Paul is content. Either way. And so in every circumstance, to be content is what we are asked to do in this passage. And contentment isn't just when disaster strikes. It's not like when something terrible happens to us, we shrug our shoulders passively and be like, ah, it's fine, I'll be okay. No, contentment is consistently trusting in Christ. I'll be okay. It doesn't matter if that's, you know, I mean, there might be something bad that happens. But contentment is consistently trusting in Christ, not just one time, but every day. It's an everyday choice that we have to make. And some of us here this morning have made the choice to follow Jesus. Some of us have made the choice to confess in the name of our Lord, to be baptized, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, to believe in the name that saves, and the cross, the power of the resurrection, the power that we have over sin now, repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. And with this Holy Spirit, we're able to read the Word. And the Holy Spirit gives us insight. It gives us understanding into what the Word is saying, what Scripture says. And we are able to understand because of the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But there's some of us who don't have the Holy Spirit because we haven't really chosen Jesus. We haven't we have accepted him into our lives. He's not our savior. We are not relying on his strength. We are relying on our own. And for those of us who do know the scriptures because of the Holy Spirit, we have a responsibility to share and teach and show and explain the word of God to those who might not understand. Like if you think back to the Ethiopian eunuch, and you think back to Philip in Acts, Acts chapter 8, you think back there and you realize that this Philip this and this Ethiopian eunuch, he was reading this scroll and he just did not understand the scriptures. He just could not understand. And Philip shows him and explains to him like, hey, this is a prophecy about the Messiah. This is about Jesus. Did you want to know more about this Jesus guy? And they get out on the road and they, they get baptized immediately. And but we see that Philip is sharing the scriptures. He's explaining. He's teaching. And for us, you have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the ability to know the word and teach the word to others who don't necessarily know the word. And so we can explain that better. But as I close out this morning, I wanted to um, say my main point again or say the definition for contentment. It's acknowledging our weaknesses through the acceptance of God's strength. For when we are weak, then we are strong because of Christ's strength within us. And this isn't a one-time deal. This isn't a one-time thing where it's like, oh man, we are at our lowest point, and now we have to begin to learn to be content. And we have to try to seek God's strength. No, contentment is consistently trusting in the Lord, trusting in his strength, even in our weakness. And it's an everyday choice that we have to make as a believer. That we are not going to rely on ourselves because we already know that that doesn't work. But rather we're going to rely on the God who can, you know, resurrect, work miracles. I mean, this glorious person who created the heavens and the earth who was before and is to come. That we can rely on the Savior who is above it all. So, we have to make the choice to seek God every day. Will you pray with me? Dear God, um, I just thank you for us being able to be here this morning in community and being able to see each other um, and, you know, be encouraged by each other's company. Um, 
and to be able to share words of encouragement with, with other people who man, might have a lot of worries, a lot of things to worry about, and a lot of things to be anxious about. But help us to know that your strength conquers. Like, like it, it surpasses our weaknesses. It surpasses our worries because we know that when we rely on you, when we are weak, in our weakest moments, it is when your power is able to work within us the most. Um, and so be with us this next week. Um, and whatever, help us to do whatever you're calling us to do this next week as well. And in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ethan. You know, as we um, kind of prepare for ourselves for communion, if you have not got a little cup of communion, there is some right over there in the basket as you came in the door. Feel free to get up and get one of those here as we're going to share them in just a second. You know, one of the verses that Ethan talked about is the passage out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where Paul says, um, he's talking about the Lord, and he says that the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Now, in our world today, we do not have, um, we don't have really good examples of people in power admitting their weakness, do we? I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever heard the president admit his weaknesses, right? Or maybe your boss that you work for admit their weaknesses. We just don't live in a world where we look at that as a strength. And that's exactly how God sees it, right? In fact, communion is an example, not only of what Christ did for us, but it's an example of your weakness, right? Your weakness. Communion represents the fact that you don't measure up. Communion represents the fact that you have made some major mistakes in your life. Communion represents the fact that, that you have been separated from God. Communion actually accents your weaknesses, and so every time we think about, you know, how God, and specifically this verse, I'll read it again. Jesus is saying, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. So is God's power perfect in you? It depends upon whether or not you're embracing your weaknesses or not, right? That's how we, even communion, that's what communion is all about, is we come here in rep remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. We remember that it was Jesus who died in our place. He bore my sin and your sin, and he paid a debt that we could not pay, right? And so every time we drink the juice and eat the bread, they're symbols of what Christ did for us on the cross. The juice symbolizes the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. The little piece of bread that we have that we eat symbolizes you know, his body that he bore our sins. And so when we think about this idea of our weaknesses, it just, it, it's so much different than the rest of the world and how the, view, the world sees it. When we are weak, that is when God is strong, right? And the more we embrace our weaknesses and allow God to give us the strength, the more we'll be in, in a relationship or a, a deeper understanding of what Christ has come to do in our lives. And so this morning, as we spend the next few moments together remembering what Jesus did for us, as we drink the juice and eat the bread, let us not forget that in our weaknesses, that's when Christ can become the most strong. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, we thank you this morning for the message today, Father, from your word. We thank you for the Apostle Paul's examples, Father, in the book of Philippians, and Father, the teachings, Father, about um, just how we need to live our lives for Christ, Lord. There's so many people in our world today, God, that strive for power and success and prestige, setting goals and trying to achieve those goals, and yet, Father, you show us that it's through our weaknesses that we depend on you, God. That's when you become strong in us, and Father, communion represents... Father, we come to this place where we admit that we have sinned and fallen short of your glory, God. We've admitted that we uh, have failed you. And Father, it's in that weakness, Lord, that you are made strong. It's in that weakness, Father, that we rely on your forgiveness and your grace. And Father, when we drink and eat um, this juice and this bread, we remember Jesus' sacrifice. And Father, may we find your power in us through our weakness, Father. We pray this and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.